It's been a while since I made an IBM PS2 video, and when most people think of the IBM PS2, they think of desktop computers. And for the most part, they'd be right. You know, many people are easily familiar with things like the Model 25, 30, 55, 60, 70, and 80. All those models were fairly common. But IBM did produce some portable machines, from the luggables, such as the P70 and the P75, to laptops with battery power and everything, like the L40SX. There were some other PS2 laptops, particularly the N51, which I have. I have one that the display does not work on, but I don't know where it is at the moment, and the CL57SX, which is actually what, was, what some would call a precursor to the modern ThinkPad of the 1990s. I don't have a CL57. I've never tried to get one. There's also the ThinkPad 700, which is closely related to the PS2s, as internally it had a microchannel bus. But today I'm going to focus mainly on the portable and luggable machines, such as the P70, the P75, and this L40 laptop, because they're the ones that I had readily available. Now some of you are probably looking at this machine that's in black up here and wondering what it is. This is actually what IBM referred to as a 7186. It is a P70 in every regard. You configure it with the P70 reference disk, and by all intents and purposes, it appears as a P70. The only thing that sets it apart is the different model number and the fact that it has a black case. What this machine was used for, this machine, I don't believe it had IBM badging on it, because it was sold to be used with General Electric factory automation and robotics. This machine probably was used to configure these General Electric robots and such. And so it doesn't have an IBM badge or anything on it, and it is black inside as well as out. This machine is complete and functional, although one of the latches doesn't seem to really work right, and I haven't investigated why. The only thing about this that makes it less than perfectly original is the fact that when I bought it, it did not come with the right color back panel. I expect that maybe the original was broken and that someone made a hasty replacement. Now the P70 luggable computer was very similar to what Compaq was selling at the time. Only Compaqs, I think they had a slightly different color screen. The P70 has a neon gas plasma type display which is even neon orange in color, so you could kind of think of it, and it wouldn't be out of place to think of it, as a sort of computer addressable neon display. You get two microchannel expansion slots, 116 and 132 bit, and it's powered by a 386DX microprocessor clocked at either 16 or 20 megahertz. You've seen my P70 operating in an earlier video of mine where I talked about the token ring trace and performance program. And so I will fire it up for you. A P70 could basically be thought of as a Model 70 with a carrying handle. And here it is doing its power on self test and counting up its memory. Hopefully the battery's still good in this one. These machines are very nicely configured for their time. It was a rare P70 back in the day that could have boasted having 8 megabytes of memory. Would have been frightfully expensive. This one still has its original hard drive, which is a direct bus attachment drive similar to what's found in the Model 55 and 70. And it's booting into PC-DOS 2000, I believe. But as you can see, the display is most definitely orange. It's going to try to initialize the network adapter, which probably isn't going to go too well. I have a token ring card in this thing, of course. The display on a P70 is VGA quality. In fact, it is a VGA adapter. And the internal, the internal plasma display can display not only text, but VGA, CGA, and EGA graphics. But it won't always fill the screen, depending upon what you're viewing. Anyway, being a 386DX class processor at 16 or 20 megahertz, it's quite capable of running Windows and other software that might be best with a 386. 
It can also run much more modern, modern operating systems with some, with some effort, such as Linux, Windows 95, and of course IBM's own OS2. Wow. That's a blast from the past. Anybody else remember the PC speaker sound driver? I didn't know I had that loaded on this thing. That's pretty wild. But here it is running Windows in all its glory. And as you can see, the display is definitely different. The keyboard on these, while good, is no Model M. It doesn't have the nice tactile feedback that the, that the Model M does. And I don't have a mouse hooked up to this machine, so I have to run it manually. But Windows was somewhat accommodating to these machines because you can actually choose, for example, a color scheme that helps you save power and let your plasma display panel stay cooler, the plasma power saver scheme, which gives everything darker shades than normal, such as the desktop. The screen can actually be opened up and pivoted out of here, and the screen does get hot in operation. Now, one of the most common problems with a P70 and its older sibling, the P75, comes in the form of the floppy drive. See, the floppy drive always hangs at an upward-facing angle whenever the machine is in its proper orientation. And that puts additional wear on the lead screw drive that runs the head stepper motor up and down. That's the first problem. The other problem is there's no dust shutter on this drive. So safety pins, dust, dirt, coins, Anything that doesn't belong in there can fall in there. So it's not hard to find a P75 or P70 that's in working condition except for the floppy drive. Sometimes you can repair the drive, sometimes you can't. But if the drive can't be repaired, a drive, a drive with, an, with a pin type connector from a similar vintage PS2 can be used as a replacement, although the eject button is frequently too long to fit. So you might have to transplant the eject button from one drive to the other. But that's basically the P70 in a nutshell. You are prevented from having the machine powered on when the, when the keyboard is shut by this little tab right here. If you flip the keyboard up, it will turn the power off, which is good to know if you're thinking that you might want to shut the keyboard and walk away with unsaved work. It's not a good idea. Now the IBM PS2 model P75 is basically what a P70 wants to be when it grows up. The P75 gives you two more expansion slots and a 486DX microprocessor clocked at 33 megahertz. The P75 is also quite rare compared to the P70 because while both were expensive, the P75 cost an alarming 19 or 20 thousand dollars back when it was new in the late 80s, early 90s. So you don't often see a P75 out there at least not as often as you see a P70. So those looking to find a P75 may be in for quite a search. As you can see, it's the same basic concept, same kind of keyboard, power switch, display, although the display on the P75 is actually driven by an XGA1 graphics adapter. The internal plasma panel is still limited to VGA resolution and color depth at most, but you can drive an external monitor that can handle the XGA the XGA adapter's higher level modes without any trouble by simply configuring the machine such that the internal plasma display panel is off. You get four expansion slots with your P75, two of which are 32-bit, boy that's hard to open, and two of which are 16-bit, both on the top and bottom. You get a card of ports. Now one key difference between a P70 and a P75 is also the presence of a SCSI host adapter on a P75. The P70 uses the old direct bus attachment or basically ESDI compatible hard drives from IBM, which kind of limits your upgrade options somewhat. But the P75 is SCSI through and through and so you can use any SCSI 50 pin hard drive inside and you can connect external SCSI devices such as a CD-ROM drive or a tape backup unit or a scanner. There's also a port on both machines for an external floppy. And then of course you get parallel and 25 pin serial ports. There's something else that makes a working P75 harder to find as well. IBM used in both machines little aluminum capacitors, little aluminum bodied electrolytic capacitors, and unfortunately many P75s are dying from a sinister failure of these capacitors. They leak a corrosive material all over the main board and the other boards inside the machine. 
And when this happens, in the best case, the machine acts glitchy. It typically has video glitches and other similar problems. And then it becomes unreliable and eventually it fails to work at all. So if you plan to buy an IBM PS2 P75, you should definitely make sure that it works at the time of purchase and you should also plan on replacing those capacitors. Otherwise, your machine may die. Although the P70 also has the problems with the also has the same capacitors, problems with them seem much less severe. Maybe because the P70 runs cooler or doesn't put as much stress on them. But suffice it to say, a P75, if you're going to buy one, you should definitely make sure it works. Now this machine is in need of some configuration with the reference disk. It seems that the battery has run down in it and I haven't replaced it yet. But it will start up and it still starts up well. If the P70 is best likened to a Model 70 in the desktop PS2 world, the P75 would probably be most like an IBM PS2 Model 90. Now it does take the display a while to initialize on this system, so don't be nervous if you go out looking for one and you find that it doesn't power up and start doing something almost immediately. But as you can see, it shouldn't take too horribly long. And once again, this machine has a somewhat unrealistic configuration. It has 16 megabytes of installed memory. Few, if any, people would have been able to have that or afford it back in the day, because it would have been very, very expensive. But here's the machine doing its power on self-test. And of course, it's not happy about the amount of memory that's in it right now. And it's also not happy about its configuration. So it definitely needs to be configured at some point. Something that I will do when I call this machine up to be cleaned up and restored back to perfect operating condition.